So I guess uh, one of the most important concepts that one needs to understand in, uh, in hypersonic flows is something that is called the heat barrier. So in order to illustrate this uh, concept, just let me show you this uh, cartoon here in the slides. So here you have a slender body in a, you know, in a, in a flow field. And we're going to see how the flow patterns change from subsonic to hypersonic. So you may be familiar already with the subsonic aerodynamics of uh, such a slender body. And there in the screen, you see that in the subsonic case, at small Mach numbers, the streamlines surround the body. And actually, the streamlines, they start uh, uh, diverging or getting rounded before the fluid particles arrive to the, to the body. And that is because the pressure field that emanates from that interaction is just uh, an elliptic pressure field. So that is to say that the presence of the body is actually noticed uh, very far upstream. So that will be the case of subsonic aerodynamics. As the Mach number is increased, it's still subsonic, uh, what happens is that the curvature of the slender body leads to su locally supersonic flow. And there is a sonic line there that you see as a dashed line that separates the subsonic from the supersonic region. Once that the flow is uh, supersonic, what it tends to develop is a shock wave near the trailing edge of the body. And you can see that by the uh, thick solid line. So across that shock wave, the flow becomes subsonic and then continues along the wake of the body. So that would be the case of a transonic, of a transonic flow. So this type of uh, phenomenon, uh, the shock wave that develops at transonicity, is well known, right? And it leads, for instance, to boundary layer separation. May also lead to pressure forces and control pressure forces on the on the on the uh, control surfaces of the of the wings of an airplane as it passes through the uh, sound barrier. And this phenomenon is well understood since many years ago. As the uh, Mach number increases above uh, the sonic speed, so above one then that uh, shock wave that you see in the transonic uh, flow regime moves downstream uh, to the trailing edge of the body. And then a, a shock wave emerges uh, near the nose of the, of the body. It's a bow shock. So there you have two shock waves, one near the nose of the body and then one near the trailing edge, which is a recompression shock wave. So, and then in between, you can have a subsonic and then transition to supersonic flow to, um, across a sonic line. Then if you keep on increasing the, the Mach number, then the, Mach, the uh, shock waves, they actually uh, become more inclined because the angle of incidence of a shock wave is going to, uh, to decrease with the Mach number. Then the flow uh, becomes uh, nearly supersonic on both sides of the, of the body, on the upper and lower sides of the body. And then a recompression shock that also leaves supersonic flow behind. So that will be a case of a highly supersonic flow with Mach numbers between 1 and, let's say, uh, 5. Then for Mach numbers approximately above 5, then one enters in the hypersonic regime. And in this hypersonic regime, the shock wave envelops very closely the surface of the body. And the region that is in between the shock wave and the surface of the body, that is called the shock layer, uh, engenders a very hot uh, flow there. So the flow, the temperature, the local temperature downstream of the shock is actually very high. So everything that is related to hypersonics tends to be always uh, related to uh, high temperatures. So for instance, let me show you in practical applications how this thing uh, translates. So let's look at this 
chart here. Right? So this is a temperature, sorry, this is a, a, an altitude. Here you have altitude in the vertical axis. And in the horizontal axis, you have velocity. So the range of altitudes goes from sea level till 400,000 feet. And it covers the stratosphere and the mesosphere until the von Karman line. So the stratosphere, right, is this layer that you see here in between these two dashed lines. And it covers from uh, 50,000 feet to 150,000 feet. So this horizontal axis is actually in units of uh, kilo feet per second. And this horizontal axis in these units, the reason why uh, uh, these units are used is because each one of these numbers resembles the Mach number in stratospheric conditions. So that is to say that at 35 kilometers of altitude, or equivalently at 115,000 feet, the speed of sound is actually one kilo feet per second. It's one kilo feet per second. So if I go into this axis here and I read 15, a velocity of 15 kilo feet per second is equivalent to a Mach number of 15 in the stratosphere. So that is why the reason that these units are used in these charts. So here you can see that uh, there are a number of flight systems, like for instance, uh, uh, the Scramjet X51A, the Scramjet X43A, the, another Scramjet High Fire 2, and also the uh, rocket plane X15. And they all tend to fly within the stratosphere. And the reason why they fly within the stratosphere is because the density decreases with altitude. So one wants to fly high in order to have uh, low, a low ambient density and therefore less drag forces. So, but unfortunately, one cannot go too high because if one goes too high, particularly with air breathing propulsion, then there is, a, there is not oxygen, there is not enough, enough oxygen to feed uh, the oxidizer line in the, there is not, not enough oxygen for the scramjet to operate above approximately this limit, which is the top of the stratosphere. So there are other, these, uh, these uh, systems like the X43A, High Fire, X15, X51A, they all fly within the stratosphere and the top velocities that have been achieved are typically of order Mach 10, like the maximum velocity ever achieved by a scramjet, which was the X43A. So there are other systems, right, like these ones that you see here, like the shuttle orbiter or the Apollo. These other systems, they involve much higher velocities, right? So for instance, here you see the shuttle orbiter entering at a velocity which is similar to the first cosmic velocity, and then decelerating, losing altitude, right? And then landing at uh, sea level, approximately sea level. And then you see also the Apollo, right? With a much higher velocities, with sort of a skipping trajectory, right, and traversing the stratosphere and the troposphere. So the Apollo uh, enters the atmosphere at velocity similar to the second cosmic velocity, as we saw in the uh, last lecture. In here, you can see uh, that there are uh, there are here two arrows, right, that they delimit the beginning of the of hypersonic flight at approximately Mach number five. And then there is another arrow here that delimits the beginning of the uh, hypervelocity effects. We will see later what do we mean by that. But those hypervelocity effects start at Mach 10. And this is where dissociation and ionization of the air start becoming important. One important aspect to understand related to the chart is this uh, void region that is here. This void region that is here. So there is no man-made object that flies at high Mach numbers and low altitudes. 
And the reason is that here the drag forces are so, so high and the heat fluxes are so high that the heat barrier prevents any technical development in this region. This is a region of high Mach numbers, high Reynolds numbers, and high enthalpies. So it's one of the most uh, challenging regions to uh, tackle from an engineering standpoint. So, let me also tell you that uh, uh, hypersonic flows are also characterized by having high kinetic energies. We have talked about this a little bit before, but we're going to quantify it now much better. So let's just look at this slide that I have in the screen with an example. So this is, for instance, a, a rod right, made of a tungsten. We could call it a telephone pole that is made of a heavy metal, like tungsten. And you have the density there. So let's imagine for a second that we are capable of moving this rod at Mach 10 in such a way that it could, for instance, impact the ground. So this rod has a length of uh, 5 meters and a diameter of uh, 30 centimeters. If I accelerate this uh, sort of telephone pole to Mach 10, the kinetic energy, the resulting kinetic energy that you have in the screen will be one half multiplied by the density of tungsten, multiplied by pi fourths, the diameter square, multiplied by the length, and multiplied by the velocity, so that is 10 times the speed of sound squared. So the resulting energy that I would have, that this in, uh, the resulting kinetic energy of this telephone pole will be 39.4 gigajoules. And this energy is equivalent to 10 tons of TNT. So this is to say that if I was able to have a mechanism by which this pole will be kinetically impacting the ground, the energy release would be similar to a thermobaric bomb or a small tactical nuclear weapon. So this is uh, an example that illustrates uh, the type of kinetic energies that we are dealing with in hypersonics. And these type of applications have already been thought in the past to bear potential, for instance, for orbital kinetic weapons, even though uh, these type of applications they require a, a high cost of uh, actually uh, putting those rods in orbit. So. If I go here and I uh, write the, uh, the uh, Mach number, right? The Mach number in terms of the kinetic energy. I showed you before that the Mach number square can be written as two divided by gamma minus one and multiplied by U infinity square divided by two and divided by the static enthalpy of the environment. This factor that is here is five for gamma equal to 1.5. So this is to say the following. If I take, for instance, a Mach number equal to the square root of 5, then I know that the kinetic energy, the specific kinetic energy of the flow, is equal to the specific enthalpy. If I take, for instance, Mach 5, then I will see that the specific kinetic energy of the flow is actually five times the static enthalpy. So at high Mach numbers, the kinetic energy for Mach numbers much larger than one, the specific kinetic energy of the flow is much larger than the static enthalpy of the flow. So let's put some examples. In hypersonics, the typical specific kinetic energies that we handle are of the order of 1 to 80 megajoules per kilogram. So just to give you some uh, particular examples, if one takes, for instance, uh, conditions of Mach 5 in the stratosphere, the specific kinetic energy is about 1.4 megajoules per kilogram. 
If one takes, for instance, uh, the orbital velocity, the circular orbital velocity, so that is to say the first cosmic velocity, so that will be uh, 7.9 kilometers per second, then the specific kinetic energy is going to be about 30 megajoules per kilogram. Or if one, for instance, takes the second cosmic velocity, Eleven point one kilometers per second. Then the specific kinetic energy is going to be about sixty megajoules per kilogram. And if one goes even further and takes the, for instance, the entry velocity of the Stardust probe, which was a probe returning from an asteroid, this uh, this velocity is about twelve point six kilometers per second. And then the specific kinetic energy of a probe will be about 79 megajoules per kilogram. Well, how large are these numbers that you see here? Well, so for instance, if I take the latent heat of vaporization of water, the latent heat of vaporization of water is about 2 megajoules per kilogram. So if I take, for instance, uh, the vaporization heat of, silic of silica, this vaporization heat is about 6 megajoules per kilogram. Or if I were to take, for instance, the melting heat for iron, this heat is about 7 megajoules per kilogram. Well, if, for instance, I take the static enthalpy of the air in this room, right? The static enthalpy will be about 300 kilojoules per kilogram. So you can see that all these enthalpies, all these uh, all these kinetic energies developed in, in hypersonics are way much higher than any characteristic uh, heats involved for instance, in the vaporization or melting of materials, right? That one could, one could for instance, think about for uh, using in uh, thermal shields. So we are dealing with very high specific, with very high specific enthalpies. So why, why is this uh, phenomenon important? Well, because of the following. <coughs> so the the fact that we have very high kinetic energies means that part of that kinetic energy can actually be transformed into thermal energy. So we know, for instance, for, for compressible flows, there is a channel uh, of transformation of energy that goes between kinetic energy and thermal energy. And that channel does not exist at low Mach numbers. So that transformation of kinetic energy into thermal energy becomes very important, for instance, downstream of shock waves. So if I have a blunt body like this, This blunt body is going to generate uh, no, a bow shock. So let's say upstream of the shock, I have a uh, Mach number, m infinity, a velocity u infinity, and a temperature t infinity. Well, the shock wave, what it's going to do is to decelerate. It's going to decelerate this flow, and it's going to compress it. So as a result, downstream of the shock, I'm going to find a very hot region. So I'm going to have very hot gas. So all of this is going to be hot gas. So the resulting velocity downstream of the shock wave at high Mach numbers, the resulting velocity here Let's call it u sub 2. This velocity is going to be much smaller than u infinity. And the resulting temperature, post shock temperature, that I'm going to call t sub 2, this t sub 2 is going to be also much larger than t infinity. And in particular, t2 will see later that if the gas was assumed to be calorically perfect, this t2 is going to be of the order of u infinity squared. 
divided by twice the specific heat at constant pressure. So if you rearrange this in terms of the Mach number, you would find that T2 over T infinity is of the order of the Mach number squared, and therefore much larger than 1. So I have a situation here in which I have transformed kinetic energy of a fast flow into thermal energy here. The flow is much slower and the temperature is uh, much higher. So here I have thermal energy generation of thermal energy or transformation of kinetic energy into thermal energy because of compression. So these uh, temperatures here, as I said before, they can be very high, right? So for instance, let me just give you some examples. Uh, the, uh, for instance, for, uh, for an object flying at Mach 10, in the stratosphere, say for instance the X43, the temperature, the post-shock temperature can be as high as 3000 kelvins. So for an object, for instance, flying at Mach 25, let's say the space shuttle, The typical post shock temperatures can be as high as 7,000 kelvins. And for an object flying at Mach 40, let's say the Apollo command module, the temperature can be as high as 11,000 kelvins. So if the temperature is also sufficiently high, the bulk of the gas here downstream of the shock can actually start radiating. It will radiate heat directly to the surface, and that occurs, for instance, at Mach numbers above 20. So why is the reason that this kinetic energy is transformed into, into thermal energy? Well, the reason lies in the fact that, the, uh, as, as, as it is well known from compressive flows, the stagnation enthalpy across the shock is constant. So for instance, if I put here, if I say that the stagnation enthalpy H0, that I'm going to define later today, at infinity is equal to the static enthalpy of the free stream plus the specific kinetic energy of the free stream. Right? So that will give me the static the stagnation enthalpy in the free stream. This stagnation enthalpy has to be equal to the stagnation enthalpy downstream. So that will be the post-shock static enthalpy plus the post-shock kinetic energy. So upstream of the, of the shock wave, upstream of the shock wave, we have seen that if the Mach number is sufficiently large, the static enthalpy is much smaller than the kinetic energy of the flow. Conversely, downstream of a shock, what happens is that the Mach number is going to be much smaller because the flow is decelerated. And as a result, the kinetic energy of the flow downstream is actually negligible. So from this equality, you can say qualitatively that there is a transformation of specific kinetic energy into enthalpy and therefore an increase in temperature in the post-shock gases. So, just uh, uh, to summarize here, right, uh, when uh, high Mach number flow encounters a shock wave, then the post-shock flow tends to be uh, really hot and the velocity tends to be very small. That mechanism, that phenomenon leads to a, a recovery of thermal energy, right, downstream of the, of the shock that elevates the temperature of the, of the gas there. So similar, a similar mechanism uh, occurs in, uh, in boundary layers.
For instance, if I look at a boundary layer close to the surface of the fuselage of a hypersonic flight system, I'm going to have a free stream here, right? At uh, some Mach number, Mach infinity large, the velocity U infinity, and temperature T infinity. Because of the non slip condition on the surface of the of the uh, of this wall, right? The temperature is going to have to go from a value of infinity to zero, right? So the temperature, the sorry, the velocity is going to go from some value of infinity to zero. So the velocity profile is going to look like uh, something like this. Well, this deceleration is reminiscent of this other deceleration that you see here downstream of the shock, even though the mechanisms of generation of thermal energy in the case of a boundary layer are fundamentally different from, from what you see here in the case of a shock wave. So here in the boundary layer, the mechanism responsible for elevating the temperature is friction. So close to the wall, there is going to be a layer of uh, hot gas. And if the uh, wall was insulated, then the temperature profile that one would see close to the wall, since this is the wall normal distance y, then the temperature profile that one would see would be uh, low temperature in the free stream, for instance, comparable to the ambient temperature. And then an increase in temperature through the boundary layer. And then the temperature would arrive at the wall at a value that uh, would be similar to a characteristic quantity that is called the adiabatic wall temperature. This adiabatic wall temperature is approximately equal to the specific kinetic energy of the flow divided by the specific heat at con a constant pressure multiplied by a factor R here. And this factor that we will see later is called the recovery factor. So the recovery factor is approximately One, but not exactly one. It's actually a little bit smaller than one. If you look at this scaling of the of the adiabatic wall temperature, the adiabatic wall temperature scales more or less similarly to the uh, post shock temperature at very high Mach numbers. So again, we are dealing here with very high adiabatic wall temperatures. Well, even though this uh, uh, gas is uh, temperature of this, of this gas is very high in the boundary layer. Fortunately, in practical applications, this high temperature does not translate into very high temperatures of the wall. So in general, the wall is going to be at a much lower temperature than the one predicted by, by the adiabatic wall temperature. And the reason for this is first that the solid tends to radiate when it is hot, right? So there is an equilibrium here that is uh, reached by the conduction of heat into the, sur into the solid and the re-radiation of heat of the solid away, right? That decreases the temperature. And also over the years, there have been techniques uh, discovered by, there have been techniques discovered for uh, lowering the wall temperature. And those techniques, they are actually the subject of uh, the discipline of thermal protection systems. So thermal shields have been built over the years, right? And technologies have been built, ha have been developed over the years to moderate these temperatures. And those technologies, for instance, include uh, ablation, right? Include uh, heat rejection and also heat sinks. So that is to say uh, surfaces that are actually capable of handling the heat uh, 
at temperatures that will be much lower than the temperatures predicted by the adiabatic wall temperature. So the resulting, temp the resulting wall temperatures in practical applications are in this range. So for instance, for uh, systems like the uh, X15 at Mach 5, the temperatures were of the order of 1000 kelvins. The wall temperature was about 1000 kelvins. For the uh, space shuttle or the shuttle orbiter, the wall temperature was about 1600 kelvins. And for systems like the Apollo, the Apollo command module, the wall temperatures were about 2500 kelvins. So these temperatures, as I said, are much smaller too than the uh, uh, post-shock temperatures that I outlined here. So still these temperatures can compete uh, with uh, materials of interest for, for aeronautical engineering. For instance, if I compare these temperatures to the melting temperatures to the melting temperatures of uh, high heat resistant alloys or other materials used for thermal shields, I will, I will find that the temperature, for instance, for uh, molybdenum, the melting temperature is about 2700 kelvins. For uh, zirconium, the melting temperature is about 2200 kelvins. For beryllium, the melting temperature is about 1500 kelvins. For, heat, for a heat resistant alloy like the uh, Incon LX, the melting temperature is about 1700 kelvins. And for stainless steel, the temperature, the melting temperature is about 1600 kelvins. So these uh, wall temperatures achieved in hypersonic flows can very much compete with uh, temperatures of high performance materials, like these ones that you see here. So just to give you an example, uh, let's look at the surface of the of the X-15 after a flight in 1967 and reached uh, Mach 6.7. So let's see this video. So in this video you can see the state of the fuselage after the hypersonic flight of the of the X-15. Uh, that white paint that you see there was uh, an ablator that covered the the X-15 prior to flight, and then after it became charred, like what you see in the in the screen, with uh, significant damage. Well, so these uh, high post hoc temperatures that I have uh, been telling you about in this in this sketch, uh, there are uh, a number of uh, processes that are activated because of these high temperatures, and they are actually the culprit of of hypersonics. Uh, they are actually responsible for making the field of hypersonics so challenging. So, in order to see uh, those effects. 
let's look at the as the chart in this slide. So in this slide, you have as before in the vertical axis altitude, and in the horizontal axis you have uh, the flight speed in kilofeet per second. Again, uh, the horizontal axis uh, can be understood as the Mach number in the stratosphere. So uh, temperatures of about 800 kelvins, right? The gas uh, ceases to be uh, calorically perfect. So a calorically perfect gas, uh, I should say that a calorically perfect gas is a gas that follows the equation of state, the gas, the ideal gas equation of state, and it has a constant specific heat, right? So this is the easiest description, and the description that, for instance, one can use for supersonic and highly supersonic flows. This description tends to fail for temperatures, for post shock temperatures, or temperatures in general larger than 800 kelvins. And these temperatures are associated, for instance, with Mach numbers of order 4 to 5 in the stratosphere. For temperatures larger than 800 kelvins, and for Mach numbers larger than 4 to 5, the hypothesis or the approximation of calorically perfect gas is no longer good. And the reason is that uh, the gas molecules, like for instance, if these were two uh, atoms of oxygen, the energy of the gas is sufficiently high to start exciting uh, vibrational degrees of freedom in these degrees of freedom in these uh, molecules. So that is to say that part of the energy of the gas starts becoming a store in, uh, in the vibrational degrees of freedom. So the main consequence of that is the non-constancy of the, of the CP. So the CP then becomes a complex and nonlinear function of the temperature. And the description of this uh, is actually the subject of physical gas dynamics, and we will see part of it later. So if we go back to the chart, so our Mach numbers about four to five, the uh, calorically perfect gas assumption uh, becomes a uh, about one, and then one has to take into account vibrational excitation. So you see that most of these systems like the X51, X15, High Fire, X43, are within the range of activating uh, the vibrational degrees of freedom in the gas. Then uh, beyond that, beyond uh, the vibrational excitation of the gas, uh, the high temperatures these high post shock temperatures, what they do also is to activate chemical processes. So for instance, you can have, again, these two atoms of uh, oxygen in a molecule, in an oxygen molecule, and because of the collision with another molecule in the air, say nitrogen or another oxygen molecule, actually uh, that, that uh, collision can break apart the molecule and then generate atomic oxygen to two atoms of, of oxygen, and the same for nitrogen. So those processes, are called uh, dissociation. If we go back to the chart, you see that those processes, they tend to depend on pressure. So as a matter of fact, uh, at high pressures, sorry, at low pressures, so that is to say high, at high altitudes where the pressure is low, the dissociation processes become more important. So that is to say that vehicles flying high in the atmosphere are more subject to, to dissociation. And the effect that it actually increases the, the dissociation with decreasing pressures is related to the Le Chatelier principle. So the chemical dissociation becomes important, for instance, for oxygen at ambient pressure. The oxygen starts becoming dissociated at temperatures about 2,000 kelvins. Then nitrogen is dissociated after. 
So nitrogen becomes started it starts to become dissociated at temperatures higher than 4000 kelvins. And then at 9000 kelvins all the air is basically dissociated into atomic oxygen, atomic nitrogen and nitrogen non-oxide. So these conditions for instance in the stratosphere are equivalent to uh, Mach numbers above 7 for oxygen, Mach numbers above 15 for nitrogen. And you can see that in the chart. So systems like the X43 and the high fire were subject to a little bit of uh, oxygen dissociation and much less nitrogen dissociation. There is another effect as the Mach number increases or equivalently as the post shock temperature increases that is related to uh, ionization. So ionization is a process whereby uh, the electrons are actually stripped from the, from the atoms and then uh, the gas surrounding the, the spacecraft or the aircraft uh, becomes ionized, it becomes uh, weakly ionized. So one starts having, uh, for instance, electrons flying around or uh, heavy particles that are charged. So these processes are important at Mach number, at Mach numbers larger than 25. So if we go back to the chart, the systems, uh, re-entry systems like the shuttle orbiter and the Apollo command module were subject to, to ionization effects. And those ionization effects are important because of the following. So as I said here, uh, ionization, what it does is to generate a weakly ionized gas around the spacecraft or, or the aircraft. So what one ends having around the aircraft or in this case the spacecraft is a sheath covering the surface that contains plasma. And also another sheath downstream of the shock that is going to be uh, filled with uh, ionized gas. So this uh, plasma sheath plays an important, an important effect in the communications of the, of the spacecraft. So that is to say the following. Um, associated with the number density of electrons in a plasma is a quantity that is called the plasma frequency. I'm not going to go into the details of what it means. This plasma frequency depends on the number density of the electrons. So the higher this uh, number density of electrons, the higher is the plasma frequency. Well, typical concentrations of the plasma frequency for hypersonics, they are in the range of 1 to 100 gigahertz. It is well known from plasma physics that if I try to irradiate the plasma, uh, with an electromagnetic wave that has a frequency smaller than this plasma frequency, the plasma is going to act as a shield. So the plasma is going to reflect the incoming wave. So this is to say that these uh, sheets here, they act as mirrors, as shields for electromagnetic waves at frequencies smaller than this plasma frequency. So if there is an antenna here, right, and this spacecraft needs to communicate, for instance, with a ground station by using radio frequencies, which are in the megahertz, 
or smaller, and therefore are much smaller than this plasma frequency, these plasma sheets, they tend to block any radio communication. And this effect is called the uh, telemetry or communications blackout. Communications blackout is important in the reentry of manned spacecrafts because the communication is actually stopped with the ground station. And it's also important for, for experiments. For instance, in, uh, at the beginning of the development of uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles, there was a lot of work in uh, uh, studying the reentry of uh, experimental nose cones. And the problem of communications blackout became important because uh, one realized uh, back in the 1950s that, uh, that it was not possible to communicate the telemetry to the ground station because of its effect. So then the nose cones, they started uh, carrying what uh, they were called uh, data capsules that would record the, for instance, the acceleration, the heat fluxes uh, on the fly. And that data capsule will be later recovered uh, uh, after the landing of the of the uh, of the nose cone or the splashing on the ocean. So this is another added effect. Then, if we go back to the chart, there is also a, a, an additional effect in hypersonics that is very difficult to handle, and it has to do with the fact that uh, many of these systems, particularly in reentry they uh, fly through uh, very high altitudes, right? Very high altitudes where the density is small. And they also fly through those upper portions of the atmosphere at very high speeds. So the combination of uh, high altitudes and very high speeds High altitudes, they lead to low pressures and low densities. And if you recall from uh, gas dynamics, low densities also mean low or low densities also mean uh, large mean free paths. Then, uh, in addition to this, the long mean free paths, they also fly through these high altitudes at very high velocities. Very high velocities entail very low residence times. So as a result, one finds a situation in which the residence time of the molecules around the spacecraft is very low, and the intercollision time, or the mean free path, is very large. So the competition between those two effects leads to uh, not having enough collisions to maintain equilibrium, both in chemical and thermodynamic equi equilibrium. So another effect in hypersonics, particularly in reentry applications, is the chemical and thermodynamic non-equilibrium. This will be defined later. <coughs> so, uh, well, let me summarize uh, how a hypersonic flight system looks by looking at this uh, picture here that you have in the slides. So this is uh, this picture. Uh, provides a sketch of the gas environment around an oceanal hypersonic flight system. So you have here, for instance, a hypersonic flight system that is uh, powered by a scramjet. Then that uh, a hypersonic flight system is flying through the atmosphere, and it may encounter particles, like, for instance, dust, ice, droplets, or aerosols. Those particles are such high speeds can actually impact on the fuselage or on the ablator and can destroy the, the fuselage. So that's also uh, 
an important point to take into account in hypersonics. Uh, the atmosphere may be also subject to disturbances in pressure, velocity and density that may have an effect in the, in the shock waves and in the boundary layers around this flight system. And then the, uh, a nose shock is going to develop that is going to leave behind a very uh, hot gas, right? Also surrounded by plasma sheets that may lead to telemetry blackout. The surface of the, of the fuselage, as I mentioned, can erode because of particles or because of uh, uh, thermal stresses. And then a variety of interactions happening around this uh, flight system, like for instance, shock boundary layer interactions, uh, boundary layer transition, and other effects close to the surface of the, of the fuselage, like for instance, catalysis, ablation, and even espalation, because of the very high aerodynamic shears that would strip parts of the, of the ablator. So this picture here right, uh, represents a very difficult problem, right? a very difficult problem that uh, to date uh, has no clear solution. Uh, so one important aspect of hypersonics is that there is not a single tool that can uh, simulate uh, in the computer an entire flight envelope of a hypersonic flight system. And additionally, additionally there are no ground facilities that can provide experimental testing for uh, realistic hypersonic regimes at high enthalpies. So that makes the problem extremely challenging. Let's just uh, uh, go now uh, to explain a little bit of the uh, heat loads on the, on the system. So a system that is flying through the atmosphere is going to be subject to heat loads, right? Those heat loads they come in two, in two ways, or they may be measured in two, two ways. One of them is uh, by using the heat flux at the wall. So this heat flux is going to be measured in watts per meter square. And then the second one, right, whereas this is uh, watts per meter square, the second one will be the total heat load. The total heat load that is going to be measured in uh, joules. And the total heat load is going to be just the integral, the double integral of the heat flux in both surface and time. So whereas this uh, number here tells me the power density, the thermal power density that is entering the, the, uh, the object or the hypersonic flight system, uh, this uh, total heat load here tells me about the total heat that has been absorbed by the hypersonic flight system during the total exposure time. So these are two different quantities that uh, they actually uh, play an important role in the design of the thermal protection system. This uh, uh, quantity here can vary uh, widely uh, among the different applications of hypersonics. So for instance, let's see uh, this chart. So here in this chart, you have in the vertical axis uh, a wall heat flux and then in the horizontal axis a re-entry time. So intercontinental ballistic missiles or the nose cones of those intercontinental ballistic missiles are subject to a very high heat flux of the order of 100 megawatts per meter square. But the time of exposure is actually very small. It's of the order of one minute to two minutes and so on. So that is to say that the heat flux in those uh, crossing the surfaces of those nose cones is very high, but the total amount of heat absorbed is not that high. On the other hand, other applications like uh, manned spacecrafts, like the Apollo and the shuttle orbiter, they have much uh, smaller heat fluxes of the order of 3 and 0 0.6 megawatts per meter square, respectively. But then the, uh, the total heat loads are uh, much higher. So if uh, I'm going to anticipate here that uh, these quantities that you see here, both the heat flux and the total heat load, they are all they are both inversely proportional to 1 over the bluntness. Okay. 
because the more blunt the vehicle is, that is to say the, the larger is the radius of curvature of the nose of the vehicle, the smaller is going to be the heat flux entering the vehicle surface, and the smaller is going to be the total heat load. If we go back to the figure that I have in the slides, the nose cones of the intercontinental ballistic missiles, they tend to be slender. And as a result, they have a very high heat flux. And they are slender because they are designed to have a very low drag. Uh, for reasons that uh, it was explained earlier, uh, for minimizing the flight time and maximizing the impact kinetic energy. Uh, on the other hand, manned spacecraft, they tend to be blunt, like the Apollo command module. And those spacecrafts, they tend to have uh, low heat fluxes, but uh, higher uh, heat loads than intercontinental ballistic missiles, even though that heat load is also minimized by the bluntness of the, of the spacecraft. So let's see, for instance, an example of, of uh, the characteristic heat loads that we are talking about. Take, for instance, the uh, shuttle orbiter. So the shuttle orbiter, when it, when it is re-entering, has to lose the entire kinetic energy. Just uh, to mention here, the potential energy, uh, the, the variation of potential energy uh, during re-entry is negligible compared to the variation of the uh, kinetic energy, particularly in low Earth orbit applications. The ratio of the variation of potential energy to the variation of kinetic energy is of the same order of, as the uh, altitude of the orbit which is of the order of the low Earth orbit altitude, and the radius of the planet. So the ratio of the variation of the kinetic energy to the variation of the potential energy tends to be of the order of uh, 100. So the variation of the kinetic energy is much more important. Well, for the case of the space shuttle, that variation of kinetic energy is about 3.1 terajoules, and that entire variation needs to be dissipated into heat. So that is the amount of heat that it needs to be dissipated in the atmosphere. The heat, uh, following some simple calculations, will give to a person free heating and electricity for almost 1,000 years. But it is also uh, important to say that uh, the heat that you see there, the 3.1 terajoules, not all that heat is actually absorbed into the vehicle because otherwise the vehicle will basically disintegrate. Uh, just a 1% of that heat that you have seen in the slide is actually absorbed into the vehicle. And this ratio here was a particular ratio that was, that was calculated back in 1958 in a famous study by Allen and Eggers. The fraction of heat that is absorbed by the spacecraft can be approximated following the study of uh, Allen and Eggers as the skin friction multiplied by the wetted surface and divided by twice the drag coefficient and the frontal area of the spacecraft. So this is a fundamental result of the theory of Allen and Eggers that we will see later. Uh, this ratio here establishes that only a fraction of the of the kinetic energy, variation of kinetic energy is absorbed as heat by the spacecraft. And that fraction is inversely proportional to the frontal area and is inversely proportional to the drag coefficient. So this is to say the following, and it is counterintuitive. It is that the higher the drag force is on the vehicle, the higher the drag coefficient is, the smaller is the total heat load on the vehicle. And this is counterintuitive because when one talks about drag, one always thinks about friction, right? Uh, as a result, if uh, one thinks about increasing the drag coefficient, one would always think that one is dissipating, one is actually having more heat dissipated into the structure of the, of the, of the spacecraft. Well, it is not like that. The reason why uh, blunter vehicles, they lead to smaller heat loads is because blunter vehicles lead to a stronger shock waves, stronger bow shocks. 
And these ball shocks are the ones that are going to dissipate most of the heat. And this heat is going to be convected later. So by using a blunt body, what one does is to enable heat dissipation across these uh, bow shocks, right? And then the heat will be later convected downstream of the spacecraft. And that's the reason why, for instance, uh, capsules like the, like the Apollo capsule have, are very blunt, right? They're actually very blunt. It's in order to uh, minimize heat loads and uh, also related to the minimization of the heat load is going to be the minimization of the, of the decelerations. As the capsule is entering in the atmosphere, the bluntness of the capsule also leads to minimum decelerations, which is important for the, for the crew inside the, the capsule. Well, so I think arrived at this point, uh, uh, we're going to uh, continue by uh, talking about another subject. Uh, and this subject is going to be uh, chapter two, which is uh, implicit hypersonic flows. When I think about a uh, course in hypersonics, I think about a hike. On a hike across Death Valley. The structure of a course in hypersonics is mostly similar to that hike that you have in the screen. So the hike starts going down a slope, looking at the engineering applications of the field, uh, and seeing the landscape, right? Let's say this could be Dante's point in in uh, the valley, and then goes about traversing a very dry lake with a lot of heat and almost no water, and that will be the part of invisible flows. And then uh, the course continues looking, uh, looking at viscous flows and going a little bit up a slope uh, with the thermochemical effects. And then at the end, seeing everything again from a high viewpoint and seeing what are the applications of hypersonics again in detail by looking at aeromechanics. So even though the central part of the hike may be dry, right, and it is related to invisible flows, that central part is very important because it sets the stage for the entire field and it also uh, provides an uh, explanation of uh, very basic and fundamental aspects of hypersonics. Most of the theory of invisible flows, despite the fact that uh, I pointed out before that uh, the calorically perfect gas approximation ceases to be valid very soon in, along the Mach axis. Most of the theory of invisible flows has been built on the basis of calorically perfect gases. And even though there are some aspects of the solution when one uses the approximation of calorically perfect gases that are, uh, that are um, inaccurate, like for instance the temperatures, many other aspects like for instance the forces, the pressure forces that are being generated, those are very accurate. So it is worth uh, studying uh, implicit hypersonic flows using uh, the calorically perfect gas approximation as a simplifying hypothesis. So before doing that, I have to remind you of uh, uh, some basic concepts. So this uh, first basic concept that I'm going to talk here is uh, isotropic flow. What does one mean about when one mentions or talks about isentropic flows. Well, so if I have a flow, right? This could be a streamlines, right? And here I have a velocity vector u. An isentropic flow is a flow such that the uh, material derivative of the entropy is equal to zero. So this is to say the following is that uh, along their path lines, the fluid particles, as they move in the field, their entropy is constant. So the entropy, the entropy of the fluid particles along the path lines is actually constant. So the entropy is just transported. 
if I develop this material derivative, this will be equal to the partial derivative of the entropy with respect to time plus the velocity vector multiplied by the uh, entropy gradient. So in a steady flows, which are going to be most of the flows that I'm going to be describing here, this time derivative is zero. And then I end up with a condition that is just that the velocity vector multiplied by the gradient of entropy is equal to zero. So that means the following, if I look at these streamlines, then I'm going to realize that uh, along these streamlines, I'm going to have some uh, entropy in each one of them. And this entropy is going to be different per the streamline. And it's going to be such that the gradient of entropy is perpendicular to the velocity vector because of this condition. So the gradient of entropy is going to be always perpendicular to the, to the velocity vector for an isentropic flow. This uh, condition here can also be written in terms of a directional derivative. So if I take a unique vector in the tangential direction to the streamlines, this condition here leads to the fact that the variations of the partial variations of the entropy with respect to that tangential coordinate L are going to be zero, right? So this will be a unit vector E sub L, this tangential coordinate L. So the variations are going to be zero. Why, are the, why is this important? Well, if I take uh, the momentum equation, If I take the momentum equation for an invisible flow, and then I multiply the entire momentum equation by a unit vector in the tangential direction to the streamlines, and I discard, I neglect the uh, unsteady term, then I can perform this multiplication and I have to be careful, for instance, with this term. So this term here can actually be rewritten by using vector calculus as the gradient of the kinetic energy minus the velocity multiplied by the vorticity. So he, these inverse triangles in this notation, they denote the cross product, cross product. So if I go and I multiply this entire term by unit tangential to the streamlines, by unit vector tangential to the streamlines, then I'm going to realize that this uh, term here is telling me that I'm multiplying this tangential vector by this quantity, and this quantity here, I have a velocity, and then the vorticity is going to be whatever vector, going to be pointing in whatever direction, and then the velocity multiply cross product by the vorticity is going to give me a vector which is going to be perpendicular to both the vorticity and the velocity. So if I multiply that vector by this unit vector in the tangential direction, that product is going to be zero. And as a result, what I'm left with is the following. So I will be left with the directional derivative of the, of the kinetic energy. And on the other side, I will be left with the 1 minus, minus 1 over rho multiplied by the directional derivative of the pressure. If I look at this equation, and if the density was constant, if the density was constant, then I could rewrite this equation as the partial derivative with respect to L of P plus rho multiplied by the kinetic energy equal to zero. And I could integrate this equation to give me this other one, pressure plus rho multiplied by the kinetic energy. But multiplied by pressure mass plus the density multiplied by the kinetic energy, and this will be equal to a constant. So this equation here 
you may be familiar with this equation already and it's called the Bernoulli's equation. But this Bernoulli's equation that you have in the, in the screen is only valid for systems that have constant density. Obviously, a system which is a gas, right, is going to be, is not going to have a constant density at uh, high Mach numbers. So this hypothesis here of constant density is not valid for our analysis. And as a result, this Bernoulli's equation for incompressible flows is not useful. In order to obtain an expression for, for accounting for the variations in density, what one does is to uh, take the first principle of thermodynamics and then uh, write it as uh, the inexact differential of the, of the heat will be equal to the differential of the specific internal energy plus P pressure multiplied by V of 1 over rho. This can be rewritten in terms of the enthalpy by using that the enthalpy is equal to the specific internal energy plus P over rho. Then the differential of the, of the enthalpy is going to be equal to the differential of the internal energy plus uh, P multiplied by V1 over rho plus uh, Vp divided by rho. So if I substitute this expression here, I'm going to have an alternative form of the first principle that is going to be Vh minus uh, Vp over rho. So this uh, ex inexact differential of the heat can be related to the entropy by saying the following. We know from the second principle of thermodynamics But if you take a, 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 a system like this, and then the system is surrounded by an environment, we know that the total amount of uh, entropy variation in this surrounding plus system is going to be the variation of the entropy of the universe. So the variation of the entropy of the universe is going to be the variation the variation of the entropy of the universe is going to be the variation of the entropy of the system plus the variation of the entropy of the surroundings. And this variation of the entropy of the surroundings is just uh, minus the inexact variation of the heat divided by the temperature. So this total variation of the entropy of the universe is always larger or equal to zero. For systems that are reversible, the variation of entropy of the system equilibrates with the variation of the entropy of the surroundings. That is, for instance, for systems that are quasi-static. And those are the type of systems that we're going to be dealing with here. So as a result, the entropy, the variations of the entropy can be written as the inexact variation of the heat divided by the temperature. So what I could do is to rewrite the, uh, the first principle of thermodynamics as T dS will be equal to dH minus uh, dP over rho. If the system is isentropic, therefore there, is no, there are no variations of entropy. And then if I take the directional derivative here, I would end up with the fact that the uh, Variations of the, of the entropy in the tangential direction need to be equal to 1 over rho multiplied by the variations of the pressure in the tangential direction. If I substitute this expression that comes from isentropic flows into the momentum equation, there, then I'm going to obtain uh, an alternative form of the Bernoulli equation. So we'll obtain on the left hand side that the variation with respect to the tangential direction of the kinetic energy divided the, of the specific kinetic energy is equal to the minus uh, variation of the enthalpy in the tangential direction. So I can integrate this equation and obtain that the sum of the enthalpy plus the kinetic energy, the specific kinetic energy is equal to a constant. This constant is called a specific stagnation enthalpy. And this constant 
is a constant that depends on the streamline. So this uh, relation that you have here we call the Bernoulli's equation. for compression flows and relates the enthalpy with the specific kinetic energy and the sum of these two is equal to a constant along any streamline and that constant depends on the streamline so next uh, lecture we are going to talk about the static and stagnation quantities and we will elaborate a little bit more on that